Hi, um, everyone. Uh, JB Jean-Baptiste Roulet, that's for the Canadian French here. And um, I have worked on SLOS since 2006 about, or maybe 2004, if I can say so. I live and work in Spokane, Washington. Uh, that's far west. Um, and I work at the um, College of Pharmacy of Washington State uh, University. Hi, I'm Elaine Tierney. I'm a pediatric and adult psychiatrist working with SLO since 1999. I'm in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins and Kennedy Krieger Institute. Hi, Chris Wassef. Um, I guess I met most of you yesterday, but uh, at the National Institutes of Health, I'm a PhD working on smith only opiates since 1998. So, Denny Porter, I'm a senior investigator at the Child Health Institute at the NIH and have been uh, smith only opiates was the initial disorder that I studied in my lab and clinical team and working on it since 96 when I set up my research group. Hi, I'm Bill Rizzo. I'm at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and I am a pediatrician, a geneticist, and a specialist in metabolic diseases. I see all kinds of patients with all kinds of different diseases in my clinic, including SLOS. Um, and you just saw me <laughs> this morning for quite some time. I'm Ellen Elias. I live in Denver, Colorado, and I work at Children's Hospital Colorado. I'm the medical director of a clinic called the Special Care Clinic. It's the largest clinic in the entire country caring for children with complex medical problems and many of whom have underlying genetic disorders. Um, we have more than 4,800 patients who come to our clinic, not just from Colorado, but all the multiple surrounding states as well. And I was one of the original um, people um, involved in identifying the cholesterol uh, metabolic error in smith lumley in 1993. You just heard me too. I'm Kevin Francis. I'm a PhD researcher um, in Sanford Research in Sioux Falls, South Dakota now, um, but I did um, a research training in Smith & Opitz in Dr. Porter's lab here at NIH, and I've been in South Dakota for a few years now with my own lab focused on um, IPS cell models for Smith & Opitz. I'm Simona Bianconi. I'm also a pediatrician and clinical geneticist. Um, I work on a number of rare diseases in the research setting, including smith lemley opitz at NIH with Dr. Porter. Okay, first off, we have some... Now? Okay. Um, first off, we have some... We opened up questions to the Facebook family group so the people couldn't be here. We could um, ask for them. And this is sort of a hot button topic in the family group, so we'd love to get kind of a, I don't know if we can get an end all be all answer, but that would be great. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on treating with statins? So, <laughs> so easy, I don't recommend it. I, I think we had a proof of principle clinical trial um, but I don't think that the benefit outweighs the potential risks of using statins. So I think it gives us an indication of where future drug development for SOS could go. Um, but I don't use them, nor would I recommend putting kids on SOS kids on a statin. The reason I think that um, our families are asking is we know of researchers that do use them. Um, and is there a point at which the benefit um, is greater than the risk? All I can address is the, it was a controlled study that was done. There is this statistical benefit, which I don't think was reflected in what I would call a clinical benefit. We clearly had an individual who I would not have expected to develop cataracts, develop cataracts afterwards. There are risks to the drug 
and without a clear clinical benefit, I wouldn't recommend using them. That's the reason to do a formal trial. A controlled trial means that there was a group of individuals who were on the actual medicine and a group of individuals who were on a placebo, kind of like uh, a sugar pill, essentially. Thank you. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I have never used um, statins, and one of the reasons why um, uh, I, I never thought to do it on a research basis was that um, many of my patients are more severely involved, and in an animal model, um, using um, statins in very severely affected animals um, led to um, lethality, so I was scared to death to use them in people. Okay. Um, I'm just going to read these as they were posted. Uh, Marianne hunches over, complaining of belly aches. I'm not sure if it's her prescribed food or improper care of feeding by third parties or growth spurts or general GI issues. She walks hunched over, belly aching all of the time. I had a Gruber placed for a short time. She has had it for seven years, her whole life almost. It is that uncomfortable, poor kid. I don't pretend to imagine and I cannot know, let her know that I relate. Is there anything that you can recommend for relieving her pain? Um, so uh, GI stuff, as I mentioned earlier this morning, um, can be very, very challenging, um, gastrointestinal problems. And there are many, many of them. Constipation, as has already been mentioned, is extremely common in patients. Um, there are lots of ways to treat constipation. And, um, and if it really, really is bad enough, it often requires the use of medications. And um, a gastroenterologist can help with that to figure out what the best regimen might be. Um, also, I, I was talking earlier today about um, some of the other problems that can cause pain and discomfort in addition to constipation. So um, gastroesophageal reflux disease is, is also very common. And then this business with food allergies and EOE, I have a number of my patients who um, uh, had biopsies to look to see what was going on. Did they have ulcers? You know, what was happening? And were found to have this allergic reaction in, inside in their esophagus and their stomach and sometimes even further down into the intestine with these cells called eosinophils, which respond as an allergic reaction to certain foods. And the treatment for that is a very strict regimen of um, restricting whatever foods a person might be allergic to, and that often requires an, uh, an allergist to work along with a GI doctor to figure out what the best diet should be. Um, there are also many different kinds of formulas now, and um, some of them are milk-based, some of them are soy-based, some of them are based on other kinds of vegetables and proteins, and, um, and sometimes it's a trial and error thing to figure out what formula is best tolerated by that particular patient. One of the things that we were talking a little bit last night, and, and many of the families here have already participated in some of the national um, medical databases, filling out the forms to be registered in case there's a study that comes up. Um, different either private companies or, or government agencies um, have databases. Um, how are, important are they to research? And do you suggest that people be open to being in them? And if they do sign up for them, what does that exactly mean? So I think a registry owned by the parental group would provide information to, that could potentially provide insight into a lot of the questions that we heard. It provides a means to collect information across the large group Perhaps we've had a number of questions uh, from families who have older uh, children or young adults with SLOS. We don't necessarily know the answers. We don't necessarily know the problems that will be encountered as these individuals get older. Um, 
we don't necessarily see those individuals at the NIH in a natural history trial because it's more difficult for families with older individuals to travel. So, you know, that's information that can be collected. It can be then mined. Um, and perhaps we can, by, you know, putting our experience together, uh, we can perhaps gain insight to give you answers to the questions you have. They're very valid questions. I'm Marty Drake, and I'm here from Houston with the girl in the yellow who was so loud yesterday, Chandler. She's uh, 31 this month, and I have a question about aging. I never thought I'd even think about the aging process, but she has full-fledged osteoporosis, and we went to Baylor for one of our regular checkups last week in Houston, and um, she, the doctor asked about periods, and, and they used to be pretty regular, and then they kind of got spotty, and now, except for this week on the plane yesterday, she, she hadn't had her period in a year. So, um, she mentioned, the doctor mentioned menopause, is that possible, this early? And then I told her she was on risperidone, and she said that will stop period sometimes. Is that true? I haven't had a chance to look it up. It was just last week that we went to the doctor. Can um, that stop yes, um, menses? Um, risperidone can, can increase prolactin levels. And if that's high enough, then the, the, the periods um, will, will, um, will stop but the, the doctors can obtain a blood test of, of the prolactin. Something that's important to know about prolactin level that isn't really out there with much info, is if somebody is agitated, when the blood draw is being done, then the prolactin level pops up to oh, the 30s yeah. at least, mm -hmm. which is abnormal range. So, so if you didn't know that it would pop up like that, then a doctor might, might misinterpret that result. And one other thing to, to know about risperidone, if it's working well uh, as a medicine and the prolactin level is high, the doctor can give a low dose of Abilify, and that will bring the prolactin level down. Ambilify? Uh, Abilify. Abilify. I mean, it is a medicine that is not my first choice. I'll talk about it tomorrow. It's not my first choice is that a in SLO. Antidepressant? It's an antipsychotic like risperidone, but yeah. you can use the two together. Two and a low dose of it, a low dose of it will bring the prolactin down to okay. normal. So or an, an elevation that's in the okay range. How do you ever get a good reading on prolactin? Because she's always agitated when they draw well, blood. Um, it's okay. Uh, you, you, you can still get it and just the doctor can know that it'll be a little bit elevated, not the uh, above oh, 100 is what we're, we're more concerned, and usually a blood level you're agitated will get into the 30s or 40s, but I'll see okay. if any the pediatricians so one, want to comment. One way to avoid um, the, the blood draw, um, and it doesn't always work, not 100%, um, to avoid the blood draw being influenced by stress would be to actually have an IV placed and then the blood draw being at a different time point. That's interesting. Um, which obviously is not something that's often done at a phlebotomist, so it would require um, either kind of a pediatrician who would feel comfortable or a pediatric practice who would feel comfortable with that or a more kind of day hospital setting. Um, but that is what is done often to get hormone readings in general um, that are influenced by stress, such as cortisol or other That's hormones. Just want to make uh, one point that refers back to the previous question by if we know that a number of individuals are developing osteoporosis, thank you, or some problem as they get older, that's information that can be used by investigators to then say, do I have a general problem? Should I start looking at what's causing that? And so in a lot, of, I'd refer to it as you have a database that then people can go in and form hypotheses. Because I'm not going to start testing for it without an idea that I'm likely going to come up with abnormalities. But if I know those abnormalities are there, you can start looking. You can start looking earlier and trying to see is this something common? 
Is it something we can do, potentially do a correct early or institute measures early to try to prevent it? So I'm going to pick up on that. So there, everyone with smith lumley opitz can have a number of risk factors that are very general for osteoporosis, but what a database like that would help. Is there something specific to smith lumley opitz in addition to maybe not being as mobile, not having as much, much weight and muscle mass on your bone because it's actually muscle mass and muscle activity um, plus kind of your puberty surge of estrogen that actually um, your peak bone mass is reached in early adulthood and then decreases ever since early adulthood, which is why when you're much older in the general population, you get osteoporosis. But a database like that would be able to identify is there something in addition to being a um, child with special needs, possibly in a wheelchair, that is specific to SLOS um, that increases the risk of osteoporosis. I'll add a few words in too as well. Um, I'll if someone is non-ambulatory, they're going to develop, they're going to lose mineralization in their bones, so they'll be more likely to develop osteoporosis, and also pathologic fractures. So fractures that occur when you don't expect it to occur is something that I think is an important point that should be looked at. If we're going to do a, a, a large registry, those are the kind of questions that really we can get answers to right away. And I've been involved with another chronic disease um, in which we found osteopenia and osteoporosis in patients, we wouldn't have ever expected it without actually doing the DEXA scans and the other things. And we don't think it's related to the non-ambulation of these patients. So it's, it, we might learn a lot of new things about this whole business about bone metabolism in the process. Uh, I was going to say that um, I have learned so much from my patients over the years in terms of things that they reported to me that I never knew that led to whole new areas of investigation and trying to figure out what was going on. <coughs> so I, I already told you that the reason I got interested in the eye problems is that one of my patients lost her vision and that made me go look at all my other patients and oh my gosh, they all have similar abnormalities. I, I remember getting called um, by the mom of one of my patients who said, Dr. Elias, my child is in the swimming pool. And I said, oh, that's nice. And she said, you don't get it. She has never been able to go outside in the summertime until now. And that's when I learned about the photosensitivity that some patients have. And it, it wasn't anywhere in the literature at that point, but it was from a parent telling me that, that this was a problem her child had had her whole life that it's like, oh my goodness, and then, and then we started, you know, to look at that. Um, and so if you tell us these things, you know, like the question about cancer that came up this, over the past couple of days, um, you know, and I just have a, a patient who was uh, diagnosed with cancer, I, um, it makes me really, really want to think about the mechanisms of that and trying to figure out, is there a risk that we don't know about yet, but maybe we should? Um, so we really appreciate the information that you share with us and the best way to save it and have access to it for all the people who might want to think about SLO and do research is to have a, a database registry. Um, and as Dr. Porter stated, the best place for that to live is with you is with the family support group. So, you know, it's not owned by a drug company or it's not owned by, you know, one person in one location, but actually some, some place that everybody can have access to it and everybody can contribute to it. My daughter is 25 and she's genetically male, but could not be made male. They did not watch the horm well, they took the testicles out of her belly at six months when they found them put in the G-tube. They did not um, keep an eye on her at all about the hormones. So two years ago, we went to endocrinology, which we never really went to when she was growing up. My daughter has severe osteoporosis and brittle bones because of them not keeping an eye on it. Now she gets the prolia injections every six months and the bone uh, density tests, and um, she's on estrogen now. So 
if any of you are in the same boat, please make sure that you talk to your doctors about keeping an eye on the hormones because they don't have any. And the bones are very important. They need that. So. When, are you finished? Yeah. when uh, Chandler's doctor said something to me like, uh, you know, if she should fall and break her hip, think about where you're going to be. And that's just an awful, awful thing that could happen. And I never thought how impaired she'd be and how tough it would be for me. And um, I know it sounds like a long way off for those of you who have little ones, but hopefully one day you'll, you'll have these problems. Uh, I don't know what the oldest one is now. I always like to hear, did you have a 52-year-old? 64. One? 64 now. That's probably the same person that was 54 at one of the conferences. <laughs> but I remember going to one of the early conferences and somebody said they had a child that was 30. <gasps> I couldn't believe it, and here we are. But we'll keep you abreast of these changes as they get older and age, if you want us to. Sounds like a new study. Anybody else? Do any of you want to comment on, I know that we're going to be talking um, with Dr. Rizzo about medical conditions of particular risk for patients with SOS, but do any of you, um, you know, want to add comment on, you know, different, different things that we should be watching for in our, in our kids as far as something like um, a child who is raised female but genetically male and... So I, I think that um, uh, it's very important to keep in mind that if you are um, genetically male and raised female, that you will need hormone replacement therapy and that you will need ongoing endocrinology care um, to, to, um, to substitute those hormones because they are, and, and basically in these conditions, it will be bone health is the main concern um, that you need your sex hormones for. Um, the other thing I think in general is that this kind of points to the same dilemma that I think a lot of parents um, with children with SLOS face all the time, that um, when you go to the doctor, a lot of, um, a lot of diseases can be um, um, looked at the same as they would be in another pediatric condition. Um, so do keep in mind, and, and for example, if you have somebody with Turner syndrome, where also um, the sex hormones aren't as high as they are, I think general pediatricians are very aware of the fact um, that, because it is slightly more common, that these girls will need hormone replacement. Um, but sometimes pediatricians and primary care physicians um, are taken aback by the diagnosis they don't know and they don't feel familiar with. Um, and that is where you can really advocate and just remind everyone that, first of all, there are people to reach out to, um, you know, remind them that on the website, have that contact information ready. Um, we are there to talk with physicians um, to remind them that um, constipation is going to be treated the same if the child has SLOS or not. Um, again, any kind of hormone deficient situation should be treated the same. Doesn't matter if it's because of SLOS or not. Um, and that that there are resources there and to advocate for your child. Um, I, I just wanted to ask a question about the photosensitivity. Um, my son is nearly 15. He has always had issues with um, sun. Uh, we live in Ireland. We don't get a lot of sun. But even when we do, you know, it's... Um, I was just talking to another lady yesterday, and I was noticing, say, the past two years, Jonathan has kind of gone into puberty now, but it's got worse since puberty. And have you seen that connection with puberty and the, you know the sensitivity getting worse like you could literally just be walking very very short distance and he's getting itchy he's you know scratching uh factor 50 all the time on him and i'm just wondering is it a thing that you get with puberty does it lessen or is is this the way it's going to stay um i can't say that we've seen it in association any difference with puberty but mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's so much puberty, but I think um, age. Um, 
I think that the skin sensitivity um, increases with um, increased levels of precursors. Um, and so it may also be where things are metabolically. Uh, hopefully everybody knows that the sensitivity in all people, whether they manifest severe sunburn or not, is ultraviolet A. There are two sort of spectrum of light. There's UVB, which is what all sunscreens cover you against, and some sunscreens cover you against both A and B, and that's what you want for your child with SLO. You need UVA protection. A number of, of psychiatric medications will also increase photosensitivity. And I'll add one or two little facts, and that is the skin has more cholesterol than almost any other organ in the body. Our water barrier to the skin that we see here is really dependent on cholesterol and two other lipids in, a, in the same amounts. Uh, all three amounts are the same in the skin. And although we haven't really studied or, or investigated the skin in SLOS, I think it doesn't surprise me that there may be uh, some subtle changes in the skin, particularly in you know, dryness of the skin, losing water through the skin at a higher rate, that needs to be investigated more in this disease. But I think that there are other features in the skin that should be looked at as well. All the issues that have come up, we've, had, we've dealt with. Um, Carrie's always been hypersensitive to the sun, always. Um, I don't know that it's gotten worse or not, even in driving in, in the car. I have to keep long sleeves on her, hot, you know, because she will get itchy and red uh, from the sun, heat. Um, and my other kids are outside, you know, we're outdoors people, so that's always been difficult. Though I didn't realize that they don't produce hormones until we have the cancer, and then the triple negative breast cancer. Um, she'd been on medication since she first started her period to stop her periods, <clears throat> and they took her off of those immediately when they found out she had the triple negative, and that's when I found out her body doesn't produce hormones. Um, she has osteopenia, no, osteoporosis now. I didn't realize that until, uh, again, the cancer. But I have a history of osteopenia and osteoporosis in my family. I have osteoporosis. Um, I've been taking prolia injections every six months, which has helped tremendously. They just started giving her Zometa, I believe, for uh, osteoporosis, the cancer oncologist had, which twice a year injection. Um, which must help also with the bone um, as far as cancers and metastasis is concerned. Um, we, she was walking for a while. We try to do as much on standing as possible for weight bearing, as you said, but also it's been a history in the family as osteoporosis. I can't think of, I'm so excited about so many things that have been said. Almost, again, almost everything anybody has, come, has said, a question about their um, child we have or she has had. Um, so I'm, again, I'm not sure about the aging. Um, her menopause, they said now she's in menopause. I noticed when we took her off the hormones, she ha her facial hair has gotten longer. I don't know if that has anything to do with that either. But um, So there's lots of changes. When you talked about um, Dr. Allen about the eyes. We've had them check, but they've never done any deep. Any, I noticed recently she's been squinting a lot. I've wondered about the light sensitivity even in here. That's part of the issues. Um, but again, it's hard to tell. We will get in the registry. That's one huge okay. thing that coming here has made a tremendous difference in questions yeah. and things. Yeah, I just wanted to say one other thing I, I meant to mention in my talk earlier that's important. Um, when you take your kid out in the sun, in addition to using sunscreen that has UVA protection, please have your child wear a hat and sunglasses because the, um, the radiation from sunlight can contribute to the retinal problems. And we wear the sunglasses, but like with the other lady um, had said, she keeps them on for a while, and then they go on upside down, and then they're off, and so she... And um, uh, psychiatric meds can make it, it um, can, um, can, can cause people to, to overheat more easily and, and, and feel hot. So lots of uh, uh, cool liquids and staying 
um, in, in, in cooler environments is helpful. And talking about psychiatric, we have to have a psych eval done, and I don't know that she's ever had one. She's had to have had one. Is there a certain psychiatric evaluation other than just a standard one to give to these, um, this population? I can, um, uh, I, I have a, uh, I ha I'm giving uh, two talks tomorrow. Um, I've printed all of the slides. The, some copies are already sitting on the desk. Okay. So you can look at that. And, and in there, I list the various things that I, I look for in a psychiatric evaluation. Okay. The other thing was the scoliosis. We had scoliosis surgery again at 18 years old. Um, and recently, I found out also, and before she stopped walking, um, her left hip is subluxed, and now both ankles are subluxed. Um, we were wearing a AFOs and standing, and then that started to, tone started to kick in more, and then I found out we had done um, serial casting at first with one ankle, thinking that would help, but then I didn't know what would be underneath there as far as possible sores and breakdowns, so, um, but now both ankles are subluxed. We've tried Botox injections for the legs to help some of the spasticity. It's helped a little bit, but not much. Um, I'm a physical therapist assistant, so I've had her to therapy and do range all the time, but the tone is kicking in still a little more, which, again, it, how do you relate, whether it's related to aging, it's hard to know. Um, and honestly, up to the last five years, till five years ago, um, things were not, did not progress that much. She's progressed more in the last five years with these issues than she had the rest of her life. Overall, she'd been a knock on wood, um, very healthy. I really have had not many problems other than when she was very young and eating Anything that was chocolate, once she became a year old, chocolate was the key thing, chocolate milk, chocolate, anything, and that's kind of the key to all of it. But um, that's a couple more questions um, before we uh, were a little late on lunch. So um, there's a few more things that um, were asked by our families. Um, uh, tissue databases um, come up every once in a while. Some, sometimes uh, um, if a child's going in for surgery and they'll do a skin punch, things like that, um, are, are there how many tissue databases? Should somebody go to their local one? Or what, um, can you talk a little bit, each of you, about tissue databases and what, if, if we do have tissue, do you want it? So... <laughs> Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so we maintain, as part of the natural history protocol, we maintain probably the largest and most diverse uh, biomaterial collection in the world for SLOS. That's what we do. We're focused in on samples that we routinely get, the skin fibroblasts, cerebral spinal fluid, blood, urine, and make that collection, and that collection can then be used for various research projects, it can be used by collaborators um, if somebody has a good idea, and that's one of the purposes of a natural history study. Your, the question might, so that's a formal collection from well-described patients. There are frequent opportunities to collect tissue for example, if somebody's undergoing surgery and a sample is taken for one, for a medically indicated reason, there's all, often a portion of that sample that's left over. Um, we are interested, if that is occurring, to make that type of collection. We have a specific protocol that allows us to receive those samples. What is important is planning, though. We can't be called up the day that the surgery is being done, especially if it's on a Friday afternoon and expect to get the tissue. Um, so plant, if something like that is occurring, you can contact us. You, we have to be in contact with the surgeons to get them to cooperate. They know what's going on. And we can make these collections and then store that material. There are more formal tissue banks. Um, that exist. Usually we're talking about after a child dies or a young adult dies. They can be extremely valuable to researchers. If Kevin ends up with a question in his IPS cell line, 
he can go ask, does that exist in human tissue, in a human brain, in a model system? Or if we find something in the mouse, we can ask the question, is this something just funky to the mouse, or does this apply in the kids? It's a very hard, understood, it's a very hard decision to make. It's a contribution to the future. It's a contribution to the kids that aren't even here yet. It's altruistic in that manner, but it's a, it's a very personal decision. But again, planning. It cannot be done at last moment. It has to be one of those things that you sit down with your, your partner, spouse, et cetera, and say, if something occurs with our child, we would like to have this to happen. With the kids who can participate in that conversation, they'd obviously, and some of the kids could, they obviously have to be on board with that idea too. But it's something that takes planning and there's organizations that facilitate that. Um, uh, Maryland has a brain and tissue bank um, that we frequently get tissue from for other diseases we study. I don't think they have any SLOS tissue that I know, um, or tissue from an SLOS uh, patient. Um, there is, is it NIDCR, NI? There's an organization that I know the foundation was initially connected with that will facilitate obtaining tissue. However, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the organization paid to participate in that for years, but nobody, there were no donations. So, you know, you can't keep supporting something where there aren't donations. It's important, it's a resource that all researchers could use. It's a resource for the future. It's a hard decision to make, we understand that. But if it's a decision that sounds right to you, then it's one of those things that needs to be done sooner and with planning. I think some people are um, for, like if their child's going in for surgery and when we say skin punch, some people don't know what that means or how big that is and it's just a stitch or how, I don't want to say not, it, that it's not a big deal, but it's, Marky had one and it's for us, it was the size of an eraser. Can you tell like, what actually happens? And so, so a skin biopsy, and we do them frequently. We're doing them for research purposes. So we do what's a two millimeter skin punch biopsy. It's smaller than an eraser. Um, if you were going in for a diagnostic reason, the physician might do a larger one because you might want the answer sooner. We can, because it's research, we can spend a month or two growing up those cells. It's a very tiny piece of skin. Um, uh, it, it will result in a scar, but you're hard pressed to find it unless you know exactly where you want to look. So I just wanted to add a couple of words about, um, Dr. Porter briefly mentioned um, about the, the decision of um, that some families um, have um, about donating um, the whole body after death to research um, and that it always needs to be planned. Um, and, um, and I just wanted to add that um, that is something that you can always plan for and if in the end, if it doesn't feel right, um, you can always not do it. So, so these are just things that you can keep in mind, you know, because often we don't know what we will feel um, when we get to a certain point in our lives. We don't know um, if the situation won't feel right. And so if you're on the fence about that or if it's something that you kind of think, well, maybe it is something that you can look into and then if for any reason it doesn't feel right when that moment comes, no one would ever fault you for drawing back on that decision um, and changing your mind um, because in the end it is your very personal decision with your family. I am wondering if it's possible to give our kids too much cholesterol 
And if so, how we would know that? And the reason I'm wondering is because Juki recently had a lipid panel and elevated triglycerides came back. So that got me thinking, is three egg yolks a day too much for him? So in, we have a wide range of individuals. Some individuals have normal, with it, SLOS, have a normal cholesterol level to begin with. And it tends to be in the individuals that have a significant amount and have a significant amount of the enzyme still functioning. Um, I have seen individuals in that case on supplementation get cholesterol levels that are above what we would recommend and that point I would cut back. That's a very small group of the SLOS individuals, um, but I wouldn't keep supplementing higher and higher if you're above the, the normal range of cholesterol and you can, you can do that in some individuals with SLOS. I don't think that, you know, you're trying to supplement cholesterol because it's deficient but if they have a normal level, it's not deficient. Then the other reason is to suppress that 70 hydrocholesterol, and there's a limit to it. You cannot suppress it to zero. So just pushing the cholesterol beyond the normal limits probably uh, does not have any benefit. I, I also wanted to point out that you had mentioned that it's um, the triglyceride levels that were high, and so the triglyceride levels that are high are actually not related to cholesterol um, intake, and they're not even related directly to fat intake, as counterintuitive as that sounds. So um, triglyceride levels um, increase often in just a general Western carb-heavy diet, which, again, I know that Juki actually eats fairly healthy, so I don't, there could also be a familial component to this um, in his case, um, but they're not, the triglyceride levels are not related to cholesterol supplementation. When they increase, it's usually overall just um, a slight increase in obesity and a carb-heavy diet. And uh, just to continue on the triglycerides, uh, it's uh, very much influenced by the fasting. So one of the first thing that um, one should consider is to impose, if possible, a good 12-hour fast um, before measuring uh, triglycerides. Um, the fast will not affect cholesterol uh, significantly, although it will um, decrease a little bit. But triglycerides is, um, if you measured your triglycerides after one of those uh, delicious uh, lunch that we had, you would have a, a, a a layer of cream in your blood floating. Uh, you, put, you take your blood, you put it on the table, one hour later you have a, a layer of cream. <coughs> it's white. So a 12 hour fast, which is probably difficult to accomplish with... It was uh, in this case. Yeah, but it's 12 hours. It was 12 hours. Okay, and maybe digestion, uh, slow digestion might also mess, mess up the, the final results. Thanks. Speaking of cream, you know, our kids would drink cream by the cupful if they could. I know my daughter would. But uh, I wanted to chime in because I had an egg question. Somebody yesterday said they gave their child two eggs a day. Chandler's been on one egg yolk, I should say, a day since Texas Children's uh, in 93. She was born in 88. They started her on the egg yolk in 93, right. So you're saying I shouldn't try to see if she gets smarter because the child has gotten smarter. I'm telling you, she will. The other day, I said, go downstairs and see if you can find mommy's phone. And she brought it back up the stairs. That has never happened before. She's following commands. She, she's always understood me, and there was no doubt about it. But um, she helped pack the other day. Of course, it was everything out of her dresser. but. You know, they continue to learn and grow. And so after that speech yesterday or that speaker or that question that was posed, I thought maybe I should increase her eggs. No? Just keep on with the macaroni and cheese every single day? So I think the kids do continue to learn. 
the dietary supplementation is not getting to the brain. So I, it, it may correlate with you doing something, but the, the cholesterol from that egg yolk is not getting to the brain and not changing the, the sterile content in the brain. But what about neuroactive steroids, like the adrenal gland? Because I think uh, uh, it, you see ch changes in behavior. So I think it's a very good hypothesis. And I think it's something that if you knew that you had a behavioral effect after dietary cholesterol supplementation, it would be worth pursuing. But as I showed yesterday, nobody has done a study that shows you can definitively demonstrate that you have behavioral effects following cholesterol supplementation. You can't design that study without establishing the base ground, baseline that you have a uh, design that you know when you give cholesterol, you have a positive effect on some outcome measure. Then it's worth going and looking. But until that study is done, it'd be very hard to even interpret looking at neuroactive steroids, because if they change and you don't have evidence that behavior changes, you still can't make the connection that that's the mechanistic. That's why it's important not to just stop at, we think it works. It, to formally establish it and establish how that, that you have a positive effect there, then you can start taking it back and looking for mechanisms. But we're sort of stuck. We don't have a paradigm by which we can experimentally, and when we're doing clinical trials, they are experiments, we can experimentally do a modification with the diet that results in a defined behavioral change that we can then associate with a change in neuroactive steroids. It's a good hypothesis. We just can't test it at this point because we don't have the baseline. We have one more question and then um, a thank you comment and then we're going to go to lunch. Um, some of our families have been in contact with the NIH pharmacy who have been generous enough to um, share with the compounding pharmacy the recipe for the cholesterol. Is that something that is typical? Is that something a link um, could be shared with the pharmacy um, on our website? Yes, yeah, so, so the, the, res the recipe for the aqueous suspension came from Richard Kelly, um, and our pharmacy made it for a long time. We, we had to have it under an investigational new drug um, application, and that comes with a lot of regulatory issues. So we, we, do no, we no longer do that. However, that recipe is available and um, Richard has freely given it out. I don't think there would be any objection to anybody posting that. Right. Yeah. And the recipe for my soy suspension is also freely available. The problem is um, that for pharmacies, compounding pharmacies to make it, um, they like um, to charge insurance for the cost of buying the cholesterol powder and, and actually making the co compounding the suspension. And some insurance companies have paid for it, um, including Medicaid, um, and other insurances do not. And so um, a lot of my families pay out of pocket for, for their cholesterol medicine. So I will follow up since we're talking about cholesterol and cholesterol supplementation, I don't endorse any certain brand of anything, but there are commercially available cholesterol powders that are much less expensive just because, yes, the pharmacies always charge for compounding, and I don't know how they come up with their pricing, but it's um, it would want me to go into compounding um, um, because <laughs> they must make a ton of money off of that. Um, and so um, the brands that are um, widely available and that um, patients have had good experience with are um, from um, Solace Nutrition, 
Um, it's Colextra and Colex Max, and actually just recently the Colextra um, was found to be safe for tube feeding. I think that was a concern initially that it would clog tubes, um, but they do say that the Colextra, they changed the name slightly to Colextra TF for tube feeding, um, that if you um, uh, dissolve it in a small amount of liquid and then flush well, it will not clog tubes. Um, and so um, that is available as a means of cholesterol supplementation. And again, is much less expensive than the compounding charge um, and can be, the dosage can be recommended by your local um, geneticist. And don't forget food sources, and, and Bob's not here. In the kids that will tolerate egg yolk, it actually is a very good form. It's actually much, that, that cholesterol is contained in lipids, et cetera, versus the cholesterol preparations are crystalline cholesterol. They work when you don't, when your child doesn't tolerate a food source. But if you can use a food source, a cooked egg yolk is less expensive than anything else that we're talking about here. And a cooked egg yolk could also be put um, into formula that goes through the G-tube, again, if the egg is tolerated. Um, point out to your nutritionist that when switching between cholesterols, egg yolk has calories, the cholesterol powders have nearly none. So when you do switch um, to an egg yolk product um, and suddenly your child is gaining weight like crazy, it's because you just added some extra calories that maybe the nutritionist wasn't thinking of when they made that exchange. I just wanted to thank you um, all individually and collectively for the work you do. Um, I'm in the medical field too, and I, as I looked around this morning, I saw kids who required tube feeding. I saw kids in wheelchairs. Um, as parents, it's, it's often very difficult, uh, you know, caring for our children, but we, fa we put a great deal of trust and confidence and hope in each one of you. And um, I just wanted to thank you for that. I also wanted to thank it's interesting to see how Dr. Porter, you know, each of you are bringing along individuals to help us in this effort. Be it be Dr. Porter and Kevin Francis, or Dr. Steiner and Kate Williams, or Christopher. Um, each of you is playing a significant role in our kids, in our families' lives, and I wanted to thank you for that. <laughs>